Hello, friends. Welcome back to our uh, series on Survey of Theology. My name is Stephen Cook, and in today's lesson, we are going to cover the last uh, lesson on Survey of Theology. This, uh, in this lesson, we will talk about the judgment of the great white throne, and then we will uh, work through Revelation 21 and 22 and look at the new heavens and the new earth. Now, last time we met, we talked about the Millennial Kingdom and the judgment of Satan and demons. And so we'll start off in this section talking about the judgment of the Great White Throne. And in this last couple lessons that we've done and in today's lessons, we're dealing with matters of eschatology. And eschatos is the Greek word for end or final. And so eschatology is the study of final things or end times, what we might also call unfulfilled prophecy. So here we are looking at a judgment. This is the judgment of the great white throne. As I mentioned in past lessons, and I'm always subject to repeat myself, uh, this is a judgment for unbelievers only. A judgment for unbelievers only. So let's look at this section here, and uh, I'll be covering, uh, looking at the verse here. I've got it in the notes. Uh, but in this section, uh, the Apostle John says, And I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it. Now this is Christ. In John 5.22, Jesus said, For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son. He has given all judgment to the Son. Now, in his first coming, he did not come to judge the earth. In fact, he says that in John chapter 3, verse 17. Let me see if I can jump back there. He says in John 3.17, For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world. That's at his first coming, but that he might save the world. But at the great white throne, it is Christ himself who will be on that throne rendering judgment. So here he says, And I saw a great white throne in him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. <clears throat> By the way, when it says, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, that's thought to be the destruction of the current heavens and current earth. Now, in Revelation 21 and 22, he's going to make a new heavens and a new earth. But apparently, this judgment will take place sometime between the destruction of the current heavens and earth and the new heavens and the new earth. <clears throat> So it says, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And he says, and I saw the dead. This would be the unrighteous dead. This, this, these would be those who rejected Christ as Savior, those who did not believe in God, those who did not accept his offer of salvation, and who are left with their own deeds to try to get into heaven. <clears throat> so he says, and I saw the dead the great and the small, standing before the throne. This would be the great white throne or the throne of Christ. And books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead, this would be the unrighteous, were judged from the, from the things that were written in the books. And they were judged according to their deeds. Now remember that here their deeds are tantamount to their good works, which are not equal to God's righteousness. So their deeds are not equal to God's righteousness, which is given uh, at salvation to those who by faith trust in Jesus as their Savior. Romans 3, 21-28, Paul says, But now apart from the law... The righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So notice he's talking here about the righteousness of God uh, through faith in Christ Jesus for all those who believe. 
for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Notice that we are justified. <clears throat> and here the use of the term justified translates the Greek verb dikaio, dikaio, which means to be declared righteous. And so we are being justified as a gift. We are being justified as a gift by his grace. Do not miss the language. We are being justified as a gift, free, paid in full by the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is by his grace. Grace translates that Greek word kodos. It's unmerited favor. It's undeserved kindness. So we are justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption. Through the redemption. Apolutrosis through the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus. In other words, Christ paid for our sin debt. He redeemed us. And this came about through his death upon the cross. And the blood of Christ is the coin of the heavenly realm that paid our sin debt. In fact, it is the only coin or currency of the heavenly realm that the Father accepts as payment for our sin debt. So we are justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation. And propitiation here translates the Greek noun hilasterion, and propitiation is a lovely uh, and rich theological word that means satisfaction whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood. And this was to demonstrate his righteousness, because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. In other words, he, he passed over them, he ignored them, because he knew that those sins would be dealt with uh, in Christ at the cross. Verse 26, For the demonstration I say of his righteousness at, at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Notice the issue is not good works. The issue is faith in Jesus. Good works do not save. Not before, not during, not after salvation. Now, good works should follow salvation, but they are never, never the condition of it. And to conflate the two, to conflate justification and sanctification, will lead to great theological error. But he says here again, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. He says, where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No, but by a law of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. For we maintain that a man is justified in the sight of God, that is. How? By faith apart from the works of the law. You see, at the moment of faith in Christ, God gives us his righteousness. This is called uh, the doctrine of imputations, in which the very righteousness of God is imputed to us. It is credited to our account. It's not our righteousness. It's his righteousness. Romans 5.17 calls it the gift of righteousness. The gift of righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, He made him, that is, God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Paul says in Philippians 3.9, that I may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. So when we come with the empty hands of faith, because we bring nothing, absolutely nothing to our salvation. Zero, nada, zilch, nothing do we bring. We come with the empty hands of faith, and we believe in Christ and Christ alone. And faith does not save. 
Christ saves. Faith is merely the instrument by which we receive that salvation. And it's not a special kind of faith. Some would say, well, God gives you a special kind of faith. No, no. It's your faith. Uh, but again, if faith does not save, faith is, has no meritorious value to it. Okay, uh, Christ saves and he gets all the glory. And you get all the benefit, but he gets all the glory. So at the moment of faith in Christ, uh, the very righteousness which comes from God, we receive. Again, it's called the gift of righteousness. So if you want to get into heaven, turn to Christ. Do not trust in yourself or any system of works or goodness. Forget it all. Just throw it away. It is of, it is of no value. It is of no saving value, none whatsoever. And so you come with the empty hands of faith and you trust in Christ and Christ alone. Man needs only Christ to be saved. Acts 4.12 is very clear, for there is no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved. And when the Philippian jailer asked Paul, what must I do to be saved? He said, believe. Believe. In the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt be saved. It's that simple. You just simply trust in Christ. And at the moment you trust in Christ, many, many wonderful things happen to you. But you have the forgiveness of sins, Ephesians 1, 7. You have eternal life, John 10, 28. And you have the gift of righteousness. So if you want to get into heaven, uh, that's, how, that's how you do it. You, you trust in Christ, Christ alone, and you receive the gift of what he has for you, uh, the gift package, and that includes the gift of righteousness. So these people here at the Great White Throne Judgment are unbelievers only. None of us, if you've trusted in Christ, we're not going to be there. We're not going to be here. This, this is not for believers. We'll be in heaven. We will be in resurrected bodies, and life will be good. Life will be very good. Uh, and so these are going to be people who are judged according to their deeds. And I know people who think that, oh, well, if I'm just good, I'll, I'll get into heaven. Uh, being good doesn't get you into heaven. It doesn't. It's, it's, it's the work of Christ and the work of Christ alone. Uh, and if you trust in good works, then you will be among those at the great white throne judgment. And you'll be judged according to your deeds, and your deeds will never measure up to the righteousness of God. Verse 13 of uh, Revelation 20, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every one of them, that is all believers of all time, excuse me, of all time, they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. And death which came into existence in the Garden of Eden, and Hades, which is the place of dead, it's the place of torment, it's a preview of coming attractions uh, until it is cast into the lake of fire. So death and Hades were thrown uh, into the lake of fire. This is the second death, which is eternal separation, which is the lake of fire. And if anyone's name here we're talking about among all the believers, was not found written in the book of life, and they will not be, then he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, the great white ju throne judgment, again, is for unbelievers only. Now, there are three major judgments that are mentioned in Scripture. <clears throat> three major judgments that are mentioned in Scripture. First is Christians before the Bema seat in heaven. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we, talking to Christians about Christians, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And this judgment seat is called the Bema seat. The Bema seat. Now, if you study uh, classical Greek culture, uh, you know that when there were athletic games, let's say a race, you would have judges that would sit on these benches, what was called the Bema seat, and it was the seat of judgment for the judges, and they were evaluating people, uh, and they were the ones who would dispense rewards, prizes, to the winner. He says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed 
for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, good or bad. Now, we're going to be judged according to our deeds, but not, not concerning whether or not we get into heaven. That's already a done deal by having trusted in Christ. What we're going to be judged for is what kind of rewards we will have in the eternal state. That's what we're going to be judged for. We're going to be judged according to our deeds, again, not concerning whether or not we'll get into heaven, but concerning what kind of rewards we will have in eternity. 1 Corinthians 3, 10-15, Paul says, According to the grace of God which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building on it. But each one must be careful how he builds on it, for no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. That's the foundation of our salvation and, and of our life. Now, if any man builds on the foundation, and notice you will see material here, uh, with regard to its composition and value. If any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, let me stop you there. That's the life of the believer who is positive to God, who is learning his word, living his word, and advancing to maturity. That is a life of gold, silver, and precious stones. Then you have, if any man builds on the foundation with wood, hay, and straw, well, that's combustible and worthless material. And all of this is going to be tested by fire. Well, look at the material and think about what survives fire. Notice verse 13. Each man's work will become evident. For the day, that is the day of judgment, when we stand in heaven before the Bema seat, uh, will, uh, will become evident. For the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. Notice that. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, gold, silver, precious stones, he will receive what? A reward. That's what we're talking about here. We're talking about rewards in heaven. Verse 15, if any man's work is burned up, wood, hay, straw. Because if the production of his life is not according to God's word or God's will, if he's not walking uh, in the Spirit, growing as a believer, then he's living in the energy of his flesh and according to Satan's world system, and all of his production will be burned up, and it will be wood, hay, and straw. And so it says, if any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. Loss of what? Well, in verse 14, he's talking about will receive a reward. He says, so when he says he will suffer loss, this is loss of reward. But notice the last clause, but he himself will be what? Saved. Yet so as through fire. So we're not talking about salvation here. We're not talking about salvation. We're talking about rewards. So he will suffer loss, that is loss of reward, but he himself will be saved yet so as through fire. So some people are going to go through this beam of seed in heaven. They're going to get there. Some people are going to come through with great rewards. Now, I want you to be that believer. I want you to be the one who learns God's word, lives God's word, walks by faith, grows to spiritual maturity, glorifies God, edifies others, and lives the wonderful Christian life that God has for you. And if you are living that life, then you will be great in the kingdom of heaven. In fact, Matthew 5.19 Jesus describes two believers. He says, uh, but whoever, and this would be a believer, who breaks the least of these commands, that is, he's disobedient to, the, to, the, to, the, to God's directives, breaks the least of these commands, and teaches others. So not only is he a bad, rebellious believer, but he's leading others into rebellion. He will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Now, he's in the kingdom of heaven. The text is very clear. You cannot escape that. Read Matthew 5.19. You'll see what I'm talking about. He will be in the kingdom of heaven, but he'll be least. He's a believer. He has salvation. He's trusted in Christ. His sins are forgiven. He has eternal life and the gift of righteousness, all paid in full by the Lord Jesus. He'll be in heaven, but he is the least in the kingdom of heaven. But then you have the believer who obeys the Lord and teaches others to do the same, and he will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, that's the believer that I want to be, and I encourage you to be the same. Learn God's Word. Live God's Word. It'll, it'll be worth it in the end. Trust me. 
so this is a judgment for rewards, not salvation. Then the third great judgment you have is the judgment of the Gentiles. That's in Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46, and you can read about that. And this judgment concerns entrance into the millennial kingdom. This judgment concerns entrance into the millennial kingdom. And then finally, you have the judgment of all unbelievers immediately preceding the eternal state. You have the judgment of all unbelievers immediately preceding the eternal state. This is the great white throne judgment that we are studying. So believers will not stand before the great white throne because we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, having trusted in Christ alone for salvation. Salvation is based on the work of Christ for us. Jesus said, and I give eternal life to them and they will never perish. So it is based upon the work of Christ for us, but eternal rewards are based on the works we do for Christ. The same. Now, the book of life reveals if a person has eternal life. That's what the book of life reveals. Philippians 4.3 says, Indeed, a true companion, I ask that you also help these women who were fighting with each other at the church in Philippi, uh, who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Whose names are in the book of life. And so the book of life reveals if a person has eternal life. And those who have eternal life will enter heaven, and those who do not will not. All right, so let's close out this last section here, and let's talk about the new heaven and the new earth. And I thought I would just work through uh, Revelation, uh, the, the final section here, to talk about the new heavens and new earth, and just let the Scripture say what the Scripture says. So John writes in Revelation 21 and following, he says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Now, new here translates the Greek word kainos, which is new in a qualitative sense. So there's some new quality about this new heaven and new earth. And so when he's talking about the heaven, he's talking about the universe. He's talking about the universe itself and the earth. And you see this going back to Genesis 1.1, which says, Bereshit bara Elohim et ha-shemayim et ha In the beginning, God created the heavens, that's the universe, and the earth. And so here we have a new heaven and a new earth. And by the way, this is not the first time this is mentioned in Scripture. You find other references. In fact, 2 Peter 3.3 3 is, uh, is a very good passage on this because Peter said the same thing. He said, but according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So as believers, we realize that this is not the final state of things. <clears throat> in fact, we live in a fallen world with wheat and tares, believers and unbelievers, and that will be the state of affairs until Christ returns. But this is not the first time this is mentioned. John goes on, he says, For the first heaven and the first, first earth passed away. So they fled away, they've been destroyed. And then he says, And there is no longer any sea. Now, isn't that interesting? So there's no longer any sea. Now, I have a friend who the first time he saw this was a little bit disappointed because he, he loves to fish. And so, you know, he said, what am I going to do? I said, trust me, you will not be unhappy in the new heavens and new earth. So whatever you enjoy today will be different than what you'll enjoy then. Uh, but uh, anyway, we had a discussion about that. But he says here that there is no longer any sea. Uh, but apparently there will still be rivers. Um, and you see this in Revelation 22, 1 and 2. where here it says, uh, and in the middle of its street, that is New Jerusalem, on either side of the river, so that apparently there's still going to be water, uh, but in the form of uh, rivers and not, uh, and not an ocean. And so there will still be water on the earth. And, and he goes on in verse 2, And I saw the holy city in the New Jerusalem, uh, and this is perhaps what Jesus mentioned in John 14, 1 through 3, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. So the picture is that it is prepared by God. 
And he said, John goes on in verse 3, and he says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne, this would be of Jesus, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among them, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And a very beautiful picture here. It says, And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So here we have a great show of compassion. And there will no longer be any death. Now again, death means separation in many forms. So there will no longer be separation of the soul from the body. There will no longer be separation of people, either people from God or people from each other. And he says, and there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain, that is, things associated with this present world, for the first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Uh, so that is, uh, he was the first creator, uh, and he's also the second creator. Remember that Jesus is the creator of the heavens and earth. So when you're reading in Genesis 1-1, where it says, In the beginning, God, that's Jesus. In John 1, 3, it says, all things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing has come into being that has come into being. Colossians 1, 16, for by him, all things were created. That's Jesus, for by him, all things were created. So here he says, uh, and he who sits on the throne, that's Jesus, said, behold, I am making all things new. And he said, write, for these words are faithful and true. For these words are faithful and true. In other words, they can be trusted. He then said to me, it is done. Uh, here, speaking about the new creation is complete. At the time it is uh, brought into existence, it will be, uh, it, it will be a completed deal. And he goes on, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Now, Alpha and Omega, those are the first and last words of the Greek alphabet. So here it's used to speak, to, to refer to the picture of the beginning and, and the end. This is Christ. And I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. And he who overcomes... Now, who is the one who overcomes? Uh, he says, he who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. So who is the one who overcomes? Well, in 1 John 5, 4 and 5, G, uh, John wrote, for, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world? but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God, who is the one who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. I think back in John 6, 28 and 29, where it says, Therefore they said to him, What shall we do so that we may work the works of God? Here speaking about religious unbelievers. Jesus made it real simple for them. He answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. And John 6, 40, for this is the will of my Father. You want to know what the will of God is? This is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. So he who overcomes, here talking about those who are believers by faith in Jesus, will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my Son. But he, here he goes on and he describes unbelievers whose lives are characterized by the following. But for the cowardly and, unbe and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Verse 9, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me, saying, Come here. And I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, which here is pictured beautiful like a bride at her wedding. 
Verse 11, having the glory of God, her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. It had a great and high wall with twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and the names were written, and names were written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel. So here we have the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel, re referencing uh, the people of God as Israel. He says, and there were three gates on the, on the east, and three gates on the north, and three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had twelve foundation stones, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Notice that. Now, though both are God's people, redeemed people, Israel and the church, are distinguished here even in the eternal state. Verse 15, the one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its wall. The city is laid out as a square, and one can think of like a sacrificial altar, it was square. And the high priest's breastplate was also square. And even the Holy of Holies is described as square. So this square symmetry is used throughout the scriptures. So he says the city is laid out as a square. And its length is as great as the width, and he measured the city with a rod, 1,500 miles. Its length and width and height are equal. So it's 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles high. Well, that's pretty big. I have a note here that this city would roughly cover an area from Texas to North Dakota, and Oklahoma to New York. <laughs> uh, that's very large. Now, we don't know if the dimensions of the earth are going to be larger than they currently are, because some people say, well, that'll reach up into outer space. Well, sure. Okay. We're going to be in immortal bodies, so we're not going to die, so we're not subject to that. But when it describes this city, again, we don't know if the current earth is going to be larger in form uh, to accommodate the city. We're just, we're not given those details. But this is going to be a very, very large city. Verse 17, and he measured its wall, 72 yards. That is, it's, going to, its walls are going to be 216 feet thick. Now, that's a, that's a pretty thick wall. And he says this according to human measurements, which are also angelic measurements. Now, that's a puzzling statement, I must confess, because apparently uh, angels have a, a metric system. Uh, that they go by, and we're not exactly sure, but he says here, according to human measurements, which are also angelic measurements, again, question mark, not really sure. Verse 18, the material of the wall is jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. And so here we get this picture of, of uh, the composition of the city, its wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold, uh, like clear glass, so it's going to be very polished. The foundation stones of the city uh, wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. It's a very beautiful, beautiful picture. Sapphire, uh, the third, where well, he says, um, with every precious stone, the first foundation stone was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth Sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth uh, chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each one of the gates was made, in effect, from a single pearl. Now, that's a very, very large pearl. Uh, and again, is this something that is supernaturally created by God uh, for beauty? Perhaps. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. So walking on streets of gold, I remember when I was a young boy, my grandmother used to share the gospel with me. And one of the things that she pointed out was in the eternal straits, uh, in the eternal state, uh, that we will walk on streets of gold. Well, here's the passage from which we get that understanding. John goes on, he says, And I saw no temple in it. Because the temple was used to point people to God, is what it was, is what its purpose was primarily to glorify God. John goes on, for the Lord God the Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. So God Himself is personally present all the time. 
Verse 23, and the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it. And so many take this to mean that there's not going to be any sun or moon. And remember that God is light, and remember that light existed even before the sun and moon in the days of creation, because God himself is light. And so he himself will be radiant in such a way that it will not need the sun or the moon. So it says, And the sunny and the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God is illumined in it. For the glory of God has illumined it, excuse me. And its lamp is the Lamb. Then he goes on to talk about the nations, and these would be believers uh, in the nations that surround the city, will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Now, that's interesting, too, to think about, because apparently there's going to be governments, and there's going to be people in hierarchical positions of authority. There's going to be kings. Well, that implies servants. It implies kingdoms, because you can't have a king without a kingdom, and you can't have a kingdom without subjects. And how far do you push that? Well, an economy, an agriculture. I mean, you get into all sorts of stuff when you begin to really think through these things. So it says, and the nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Uh, that is, perhaps multitudes of believers will be born during the millennium and enter into the eternity. And yet they will live outside the new Jerusalem. That's very possible. I don't want to be dogmatic on some of these things because... Uh, we don't have enough information to be dogmatic, and I know some people are, but I'm a little hesitant there. He goes on, he says, in the daytime, for there will be no, no night there. Okay, well, now we have another issue. So we have no sea, no sun, no moon, no nighttime. So it's, it's daylight, it's daytime all the time. So in the daytime, for there will be no night there. Uh, and this could perhaps imply that we'll never sleep. Again, one can't be dogmatic here, but it could imply that we will never sleep in the eternal state. Uh, and its gates of the city will never be closed. And they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it, that is, into, into the new city of Jerusalem. And nothing unclean and no one who practices abomination or lying shall ever come into it. And this because all unbelievers have been assigned to the lake of fire, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Going on in Revelation 22. Then he showed me a river of the water of life. So there's again, there's no sea, but apparently rivers. So he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, that is without pollution, coming down from the throne of God and of the Lamb in the middle of its street. So this is going to be a river that's going to be flowing through the uh, city of Jerusalem in the middle of the street. And on either side of the river was the tree of life. So this is, this is first seen in the Garden of Eden back in Genesis 2.9 and later promised to believers in Revelation 2.7. Um, to him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life. <coughs> Excuse me which is in the paradise of God. So here we have on either side was, was, uh, of the river was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit. Well, does that imply that we're going to be eating? Bearing tw uh, 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. <coughs> Excuse me. So the leaves of the tree were for the healing, and the word healing here is the Greek word therapeia. We get the word therapy for it, for the healing of the nations. And there will no longer be any curse that is nothing harming the planet. And the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bondservants, that's believers, that's us, will serve him. And they will see his face, and his name will be on their, on their foreheads. So there's going to be a special mark for believers. And there will no longer be any night. So no ocean, no sun, no moon, no death, no night. Uh, and there will no longer be any night. 
and they will not have need of the light of a lamp nor of the light of the sun because the Lord of God again will illumine them and they will reign forever and ever. So we're going to be reigning. There's going to be work uh, to be done in the eternal state. We're not just going to sit around and eat grapes and go on vacations. I mean, we probably will go on vacation, I suspect. I don't know. But there will be work to be done. There will be productivity and they will reign forever and ever. Remember, there was work to be done even in the perfect state of the Garden of Eden prior to the fall that God gave Adam and Eve the responsibility to cultivate it, to keep it. They could eat from uh, uh, freely within the garden except for the one tree of the fruit of the tree, the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. They were forbidden to eat from Adam. They were told to be fruitful and multiply. They, Adam was given the responsibility of naming the animals. My point is, is just that they were given work to do. And there's no reason not to think uh, that there won't be work uh, to be done in the eternal state. And so, and they will reign forever and ever. And then in Revelation 22, 6, going on, it says, And he said to me, these words are faithful and true. In other words, you can trust that this will come about. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show his bondservants the things which must soon take place, or when they happen, will happen quickly, we might say. Verse 7, And behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. So there is a special blessing that God promises to the one who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book, that is the book of Revelation. Verse 8, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. So John is a witness. And when I heard and I saw, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. This is the second time John uh, worships the angel. The first time was back in Revelation 19.10. And interestingly enough, John was corrected uh, on both occasions. Here's the second one, verse 9. But he, that is the angel, said to me, Do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who heed the words of this book, Worship God. And so he said to me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Then in verse 11, he says, Let the one who does wrong still do wrong, and let the one who is filthy still be filthy, and let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness, and the one who is holy still keep himself holy. Verse 12, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me. Remember that uh, reward is a subject that is mentioned throughout the Bible. And for Christians, uh, remember that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. No works before, during, or after are needed. It is all of Christ. It is none of us, period. Uh However, once we are saved, we are called to a life of good works, which God promises to give to us to reward us uh, for uh, what we have done in this life. And personally, I'm excited about that. I'm, I'm glad to know, I'm encouraged to know that the life I live in obedience to the Lord, that he will reward me someday uh, for the life that I live in service to him to glorify him, to edify others, to live by faith, which pleases the Lord. So he says, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. In other words, all creation begins and ends with Christ. Blessed are those, this would be believers, who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may enter by the gates into the city. Now, this could be a reward, because he's been talking about rewards. This could be a reward given to some believers who reached maximum maturity uh, during their life, and that's what this could be. It could be a reference to a reward given to those believers. Verse 15, outside, that is outside of paradise, um, one would think of in the lake of fire. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the, moral and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices lying. 
That is, here he's giving the characteristics of all unbelievers who are governed only by their one nature, which is their sin nature. Verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. He is the descendant of David, the bright morning star. Verse 17, the spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. Let the one who wishes to take the water of life without cost. Salvation is free. It is free to those who want it. Verse 18, John says, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, that is the book of Revelation, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which are written in this book. So this could either be activity that is indicative of unbelief or it could be a loss of reward uh, to anybody that would do that. Again, a difficult section here, but... uh, Uh, You try to understand it as best you can. Verse 20, it says, He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. So John agrees. And then he closes out, verse 21, The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. So in summary, the new heavens and earth will be the place for the new Jerusalem, which is described in detail. In the eternal state, there will be no sickness or death, for the curse will be removed, and believers will fully enjoy the blessings of God. All right, so that is going to close out this series of lessons, 27 in all. We covered 52 major doctrines. I did it in 27 lessons. But that will close out this series of lessons on survey of theology. Uh So I hope that this series has provided some insights for you about the major doctrines that are taught throughout the Scripture. And I thank you for taking the time to listen to this video, and I wish you a blessed day.